Warning. Warning. Attention all pharmacy industry professionals. This isn't your grandfather's podcast. This is... What the hell are you talking about? Our grandfathers never even listened to podcasts. The internet wasn't even around. Shut your pie hole. My grandfather loves podcasts and so does my maca. Your what? This is the RX Rated Podcast. Part of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. Did you say maca? Put the fidget spinners away. Punch in the coordinates for the jump to light speed. And do or do not, there is no try. What kind of hat introduction is this? The podcast dedicated to all the pharmacy professionals in this crazy sector of healthcare. Um, what was that? The RX-rated podcast. Dude, seriously, you already said that three other times. This is bullshit. Welcome to the RX Rated Podcast. This is Dr. Jeffrey Winger, and joining me as always is Dr. Maurice Robinson. How are you, sir? Pretty good. We haven't done a show in about a month, so I got a lot of stuff I want to talk to you about. A lot of shit's been going on the month of January 2021. I've got some Tennessee whiskey, and I'm smoking on my Padron cigar. Uh, any libations on your side? Um, I am drink- drinking peanut butter screwball whiskey. Ooh, damn, that sounds good. <laughs> yep, it is pretty good. All right, the first thing I want to do, I have a sound bite I want to play for you. It's 27 seconds long. I want you to tell me who you think this sounds like. You ready? Mr. Jeff Frost, how you doing? Doing all right? All right. I'm good. How you doing, Adam Corolla? Doing well. Good. All right. Give me time to answer. Uh, I do not want to roast the host, but I'm about to roast somebody in about 15 minutes. I mean, roast the shit out of them. Um, <laughs> it's just what I do sometimes, but I'm sorry. I don't mean to keep you all but carry on. Much love to you. What the fuck was that? <laughs> <laughs> now, who does that remind you of? So I, I thought it was me talking. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I remember a long, t- not a long time ago, but uh, over a maybe a couple months ago, I said to you, were you ever on the Adam Carolla show? Cause that sounded just like you. And I just got the sound bite now so I could play it for you. It's yeah, uncanny, I thought, right? I, th- I literally thought, especially like the first five, 10 <laughs> seconds, I was like, whoa, that sounds like me. I thought you were playing an old episode. It was cool, right? Yeah. Oh, speaking of cool, I just saw your video posted earlier today, in fact, uh, crazy things pharmacy customers say. Again, kudos to you for nailing it. I love the woman oh. coughing. You, you would think that, well, Voltaire said that common sense is not so common, but I can't tell you how many times people have just coughed right into the phone. And you think they would hold it away from their mouth while they're coughing, but no, that never occurs to them. Nope. Yeah. When <laughs> she, you know, I'm, I remember going out of my way to help her, you know, get her medication for her pneumonia. And then she wants me to bring her some cigarettes because I waved the copay. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I love how it opens. Like, is this the pharmacy? I'm like, yeah, that's how I answered the phone saying this is the pharmacy. <laughs> Are you the pharmacist? Yes. I also answered the phone saying that too. Like folks, you got to get your game face on. If you're calling the pharmacy, get your game face on. It's a, it's a sports term. Maybe some women don't understand, but yeah, you got to get your game face on. And then, yeah, I love the cigarettes with the pneumonia. That's, that was awesome. And they- then, you think, waved uh, the copay and she want because you waved the copay, that's that was her excuse to get more cigarettes. <laughs> if you the best part of that video so far, uh, like people have just put their comments down there. It's probably like the best comment section I've ever <laughs> seen on a video. So just go read other people's just stories. It's just kind of crazy. It's funny thing too, is I got promoted. Um, I took over that store. And then they promoted me like four months later to a bigger store. And when I moved, that lady, she called my new store to fill a prescription. It's like, will you deliver it? I'm like, no, I was closer at the old store, but now I'm at the new store. I'm further away. And I'm not about to like, she just thought I was going to keep delivering her medicines. And I'm like, <laughs> this lady wants you to deliver. I'm like, no, now a five minute trip is now 30 minutes. So I spoke to my former tech today and asked her how it was going at that store and she said that the the pharmacist that i bitch about all the time on this show has had multiple customer complaints still to this day the saturday tech we had a tech that worked one day a week on saturday she quit so now there's only two techs in that store the second tech got in a big fight with him apparently 
Uh, the new partner who replaced me has clashed with him. He doesn't like him. My partner, my former partner's answer to everybody is, this is my pharmacy, so we do it my way. And this other guy was like, well, I've got 11 years experience, and this is not how we do this. So things are just wonderful at my uh, former pharmacy from what I heard today. Do you think that, I always tell people a lot of times in retail, do you think that people are normally assholes and mean to each other or does the pressure of that the companies put people under makes them that way because i feel like there are some like district managers or district leaders that are probably assholes but you got to think it's like a weird position because it's like you're forced to enforce these metrics that you still know that (laughs) they don't have the hours for but you have to somehow enforce it so i feel like in order for them to keep their jobs, they have to fire people and yeah. show like they're trying and trying to make change. And then, you know, pharmacy managers come down on other people and it's just, just makes everybody kind of just not who they really are. Two things can be true at the same time. It can be that, and it can be that some people are just assholes. <laughs> oh, speaking of assholes, I got to share this with you. I got into a Twitter fight with a nurse. Let me read this real quick. Her name is Sarah Beth Cowherd, C-O-W-H-E-R-D. She goes by at Sarah Beth R-N. And I had retweeted a tweet that Ted Cruz had put out about AOC. So she responded to me and Ted Cruz saying, what happened to that big win you were supposed to have? Didn't really work out for you, did it? Does it make you feel better to call a 31-year-old congresswoman an imbecile? Really says more about you than her. And I replied, you're defending AOC? Really? She's the dumbest politician I've ever seen. She's dumber than Forrest Gump with a concussion. By the way, it's a pretty hollow victory when you have to cheat like a motherfucker. (laughs) So she responded, I think going after her is low-hanging fruit. She's four years younger than me with a heck of a lot of responsibility. To me, she's representing those who elected her. Honestly, I don't get why everyone is up in arms over a first term, now her second, congresswoman. Why such a threat? And I said, well, there you go. There's a shit ton of congresswomen, but we go after one and we're sexist against all congresswomen. Don't you have anything else besides those tired arguments? And Pelosi said a glass of water could have gotten elected as a Democrat in AOC's district. Remember that? So she responded, I didn't say sexist. I just don't get why she is such a threat. She actually unseated a 30-year incumbent Democrat in the primary. So I believe she's offering her district something different than they obviously wanted. No. I said, she's an anti-American, socialist, fascist piece of shit. (laughs) Isn't that a good enough reason? Do you want evidence? Say no more. It's clear this won't be a grounded convo. And I said, nice. I offer evidence and you cower. I don't need your evidence. I read. I said, well, let me guess. HuffPo, New York Times, Mother Jones, Daily Beast, and everything else that is in lockstep with your left wing views. And she responded, ha, no. But what's clear is you're used to people slinging low blows at you like sexist and racist. And so you're preemptively slinging dirt at me. Was just trying to have a real convo thread. Obviously not possible here, that's fine. I said, you don't want a real convo. I offered you evidence and you scoffed at me, please. I don't need you to send me articles. I'm well versed in politics and I read about it daily. (laughs) Do you see a pattern here? It's like, I know everything. I don't wanna hear what you have to say, which, tells me that she's more closed-minded than I am, no? Yeah. I it, it, it amazes me, like, I know you like to get involved in political banter, but it's like, when you, it's like, anytime I post something on Facebook, it takes an extra hour longer than I wanted it to, and then people that you don't even know just got to throw in their two cents, and, and then they don't like what they said, it's just like, you can't have just like a nice little quick, like maybe like for common exchange. It's just like, if you want to talk politics and someone doesn't agree with you, you better just clear out the rest of your day because it's just going to go back and forth and back and forth. As a comedian, you'll appreciate this. I have an AOC joke. This is a Jeffrey Winger original. Ready for this? AOC thinks that George Orwell played the villain in Wonder Woman 1984. <laughs> 
<laughs> I know it's not good to laugh at your own joke, but I think that's pretty funny. AOC thinks that George Orwell played the villain in Wonder Woman 1984. I'm going to pat myself on the back for that one. I think that's pretty good. <laughs> Did you that's see that fun. she went after Ted Cruz saying that he tried to get me killed, quote unquote, and almost had me murdered, quote unquote. Did you see that? What a snowflake. I know you're a, a millennial and I don't mean to cast dispersions at all millennials, but Jesus, she is a perfect representation of her generation. Like he never said he wanted anyone to kill her or murder her. What's she talking about? It's funny. I'm like so behind in politics. Well, I understand a little bit, but I don't know like every person, you know, every like senator, house of representative. But when they talk about the people storming the Capitol and they were searching out this person and that person, I'm like, uh, <laughs> what are they talking about? <laughs> we live in some interesting times. Like, but I, I, what to me, what's funny is the people's excuses who who have gotten busted. Like one guy said that when he stormed the Capitol, he was just there to look at the artwork. <laughs> 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 he was just there. I think he was like a Asian or Hispanic police officer. He got busted. He's like I was just there to look at the artwork. Like, okay, buddy, you're going. <laughs> sure. And now they want us to wear two masks did you hear fauci says we should wear two masks now did you catch that is that you who sent me that thing with like the Probably. six masks on top of yeah. each other <laughs> yeah i saw that we live in the movie idiocracy um did you know that fauci's salary was four hundred seventeen thousand dollars annually he makes more than the president does of course trump never cashed in a check he always donated his salary to some cause but Fauci makes $417,000 a year for being wrong about everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like, I guess I could, could, could see that because, I mean. If he knew what he was like talking a, about, that'd be one thing. <laughs> I feel like, you know, doctors, this is probably not unheard of for doctors to make 200 something thousand and then to have that position. It doesn't seem too outrageous. I mean, I th still think it's a little high, but I could believe it. He'll probably make more money after this going on tour. Like, you know, when presidents, when they're done, they usually go on tour and write books. He'll probably make more money doing that. What do you think about the new press secretary? Have you seen her? No. Her, her uh, favorite line is, uh, I'll cycle back to that. Every time a reporter from the media asks her a question, she doesn't have an answer. She's like, I'll cycle back to that next time. She actually said that twice to the same reporter. She said she would cycle back to him. And then on a different day, he asked her the same question. She's like, you know what? I'm going to have to cycle back again. The woman has no answers for anything. That sounds like me in pharmacy school and I ask you a question. <laughs> What's the mechanism of action? Yeah, I'm going to have to cycle back. Because <laughs> Biden passed some sort of mask mandate. And then he broke his own mandate walking around D.C. without a mask on. They asked her about that. And she had the most incredible answer, like, well, he's got more important things to work about or to think about, or he was celebrating that day. Like that makes it okay. No, if you're going to be a president and make a mandate that everyone has to wear a mask, shouldn't you set a good example by wearing a mask yourself? I, I couldn't believe her flippant responses. Well, he was celebrating. He's got bigger things to worry about. Like, really? <laughs> this is incredible. And then Cuomo, the governor of New York, his administration apparently undercounted COVID-19 deaths in nursing homes by 50%. This is in the media, 50%. And then he had some kind of cruel thing to say, like, well, you know, they're dead, so who cares? Like, wow, that, that, that reminds me of uh, Hillary with Benghazi. She had some sort of flippant response about the deaths in Benghazi. Remember that? Like, what difference does it make? You know, that was her comment. Like, I can't believe some of the shit that comes out of their mouth. Because if this came out of a Republican politician's mouth, the media would be all over them. But uh, it's, all it, it's funny. I have a, um, a group chat with it's just uh, like six other my black friends that we went to Wisconsin with that I went to Wisconsin with. And uh, it was funny. One of my friends actually made this post that I think that you will think that it's uh, pretty interesting. He's like, it seems for the last year, every time you turn on the news or open social media, there was a story of a black dude dying at the hands of law enforcement. It's kind of refreshing that we aren't constantly being 
and you did it with fear that at any moment we could be killed at the heads of the police. Call me cynical, but I think it's too much of a coincidence that a lot of that chatter seemed to cease right around the election. <laughs> so I type in and search in Google machine and lo and behold, there is no short of stories of black men being killed by law enforcement. From my little cursory search, I found no less than 11 deaths since November 8th up until January 9th. One cop got a twofer killed a 16 and 18 year old in one shot. Zasire Hill, Frederick Cox, Patrick Warren, he just like listing people. And it's like, this isn't meant to be a commentary of how we are policed, but it's more a reflection of the politics that all of a sudden is not a big topic. <laughs> it was yeah. crazy that he like searched it and it's like, still getting killed, but nobody's talking about it now. We, I mean, journalism school, I don't know what they're teaching them, but they're not teaching them objectivity. <laughs> Journalists are not objective. They've chosen a side. It's clear. I mean, Trump offered the black community $500 billion uh, for an economic plan to improve their community. And Biden is going to do what? Put Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill? Like, who, how, well, how does that help? <laughs> who gives a shit? Well, and then now Black Lives Matter is going to get the Nobel. Well, they're being nominated for the Nobel Prize, but didn't they cost billions of dollars in damages? Even Sean King is upset with Biden for using BLM to get votes and then abandoning them once he got elected, right? Yep. I, I saw he had posted a comment about that. And then during the debates, Biden said, oh, I'm not going to end fracking. And Kamala Harris said, oh, that's a lie. And the media was like, oh, Trump's lying about ending fracking. Guess what happened? Biden's going to end fracking. <laughs> it's just incredible. It's amazing. He's got, what is it? He's got 10 days in office. He's already had 42 executive orders, which is more than triple the past three presidents put together. It's amazing. Like dictatorial much. <laughs> yeah. It's like, nice. I was reading the Chicago newspaper on Facebook and it's like, Oh, the field museum is set to reopen. I'm like, what? Like what, <laughs> what changed? It was like literally right after Biden got elected. It's okay to go to the museum now. Well, when Trump put travel restrictions on certain countries, everybody called, including Biden, called him a xenophobe. But now Biden is stopping travel in, from certain countries. And like no one's raising the red flag like uh, hypocritical much. Like if we had an honest media, this would already be a disaster. <laughs> and then he let, allows trans women to compete in athletics, which is destroying women's athletics because let's face it trans women are men basically and they're beating women in every sport like why would you even Mar marcellus wiley former nfl player wants a separate category for trans athletes this is insane you can't have a a man who says i'm a woman now wrestling a woman he's gonna beat her every time i mean right <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know and then uh, more hypocrisy he was saying, well, Trump's got no plan for the pandemic, but I do. I'll stop. And then once he gets elected, here's a direct quote. There is nothing we can do to change the trajectory of the pandemic in the next several months. Like, wow, he changed his tune fast. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. Like anyone who's paying attention has to marvel at some of this shit. He said you can't govern by executive order unless you're a dictator. And then he passes 40 executive orders in his first 10 days, <laughs> dwarfing every other president. Like, it's just unbelievable. Oh, oh, did you see this video where he's walking with his wife and you know he's got the little earpiece and they're telling him what to do and what to say. And he's approaching the Marines and he's, they're saying, salute the Marines. And instead of saluting the Marines, he says out loud, Salute the Marines. And he just walks right past them. <laughs> Did you see that? It's unbelievable. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> Holy shit. Then he puts the military that was in D.C., makes them sleep in a garage. And Trump says, hey, guys, you can stay in one of my hotels. Like, it's just, I don't know. I, and then Kamala Harris plagiarizes a, a Martin Luther King speech. Did you see that? Like, was she totally plagiarized one of his speeches or something about growing up and it was almost word for word the same thing that Martin Luther King said. Like, they're so shameless. <laughs> anyway, enough politics. Let's get off that subject. I got a, a great story here for you. Drug Topics Magazine, January 12th. 
titled Addressing Structural Inequities When Treating COVID-19 Patients. Here's a direct quote. Disproportionate impacts of the virus among racial and ethnic minority groups exists. And here's the data from APM Research Lab. I don't know what that is, APM Research Lab, but they said that one out of every 1,625 white Americans has died from COVID. One out of every 1,275 Latino Americans has died. One out of every 925 indigenous Americans has died, Indians. Like, when did Indian become a bad word? And then one in every 875 black Americans have died. And they say, here's a direct quote, this is the result of a combination of discrimination and social factors that create racially inequitable impacts. How do they know that? Are they saying that people who are treating COVID patients are racists? Is that what they're saying? Of like <laughs> Biden, Biden said that there's systemic racism in this country. I don't know, you and Obama were in charge of everything for eight years. Why didn't you do anything about it? Like, where is this systemic racism? Why, why is there a racially inequitable impact? Like, are they saying that doctors are racist? I don't understand what, the, what they're getting at. Can you explain this to me? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I don't know that it was necessarily racist. I just, I feel like it affected the black community a little bit different than... Uh, that might be true, but is it because, like they say, discrimination? Is that the reason? Yeah, I think it. I mean, how can anybody this early make any correlations to anything? Well, they had a drug topics had moderators for a, a webinar event. And here are the moderators. Here's the guy that moderated it. I think he's from Uganda or something. He's got a strange name, Utibi R. Essien. I'm not even sure how to pronounce it. He's an MD. An MPH, I'm not even sure what an MPH is. He's a black guy, obviously. Assistant Professor of Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. And then there were some panelists. Nawaka Inia, I can't even pronounce their names. She's an MD, an MPH, and an FASN. I have no idea what these letters mean. She's an Assistant Professor of Medicine at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Then you had Ebony Jade Hilton, MD, She's a fellow associate professor of anesthesiology and critical care medicine at the University of Virginia, medical director. The list goes on, Goodstock Consulting LLC. They, they got credentials at the wazoo. And the last one is Tyson Bell, MD, assistant professor of medicine, director, medical intensive care unit, University of Virginia. It doesn't sound like systemic racism is keeping them down. They've got more letters after their name than I do. <laughs> but I'm just wondering, like, what the fuck? <laughs> uh, they're all, all the moderators and panelists are black. And I'm thinking maybe they have an agenda because they're supporting this notion that discrimination or something is leading to this discrepancy in COVID-19 deaths. And I'm thinking... I think better of my country. I think, no, our, our country's not systemically racist. We don't have doctors that are treating white people better than they're treating minorities. So maybe something accounts for this. I'm not saying it's not true, but it's, I don't think it's discrimination. I think doctors treat everybody fairly and equally, right? And if, and if there is a racist doctor out there, let's, let's find out who he is, get his name and, and get him out of there. But what am I missing? Is our country evil? <laughs> question like i don't understand yeah i i think that there's just i think they're you know tuskegee experiments certain history things so people are quick to you know if the outcomes for minorities isn't that of whites like sometimes they're like okay is this due to racism or is it due to something else so sometimes we kind of jump to that too soon but i feel like it's too early and not enough data to come to that conclusion quite yet yeah, I agree. Uh, more data is needed to suss this out. But I feel like there's a lot of mind readers out there that can, uh, I don't want to say assume, but jump to a conclusion without any hard evidence to back it up. It's like, how do you know that that's the reason? Maybe there's other reasons. Maybe it's cultural. Maybe the way Latinos live their lives is different from the way European Caucasian immigrants live their lives versus the way indigenous Indian Americans live their life. Like, like we, we assume right away, oh, it must be racism, but maybe it's because culturally there's different habits or something. I don't know. It's, 
I, I just hesitate to think my country is that evil and corrupt to this day. It's 2021 now. I think we treat everybody fairly. Am I naive? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's we try to treat people fairly. I'm sure there's still racism and people, you know, might have their own biases, but it's a lot better than what it used to be. And I think that sometimes I feel like people don't get the best treatment when, you know, I could see it from a cultural standpoint too. Like, you know, certain people have their certain beliefs in their culture and it could be frustrating from a clinician when you're trying to tell them one thing and that, you know, their, their beliefs are like, no, don't do this. Or I don't believe that's how you should treat me. And then you just kind of get frustrated and just like, well, fuck it. You know, it's not necessarily race. It's just racism against that person. It's just that, their cultural beliefs or things about their culture make them a little bit more difficult to treat and manage them as a patient. And then you just kind of just like whatever. Cause I, I I've seen that just different instances where, you know, whether it be uh, certain minorities and, it, you know, physicians trying to treat them and they're like, no, I don't believe in that. That stuff doesn't work. You, you know, even, you know, like with the flu shot, like you could say like, Oh, black people, more black people die from the flu because people aren't treating them. But a lot of black people don't want the flu shot, you know? Exactly. So it's not like people are not trying to give them the flu shot because they're black. They just don't trust it or don't think it works. So. Well, it's like that guy, I forget his name, but he used to work for Google. And he wrote a memo to the company saying, we don't have enough women doing computer engineering or whatever it was and here's why and they fired him it's like he wasn't being discriminatory he was explaining that women aren't interested in this area and here's how we can reach out to them he was just trying to say there's a reason why a lot of women don't go into this field and maybe we should do something to to reach out to them to make it more appealing to them like we were talking about like where's all the black nfl punters like, you know, it's like, it's not discriminatory. They're just not interested in being a punter. They want to be a wide receiver or a running back. It's not like, you can't just say, oh, well, because this group isn't represented properly in this area that there's discrimination. Well, if that was the case, you could say the NBA is discriminatory against white people. Cause what is it? 85% of NBA players are black. Right. So I, I just, I don't, I can't follow the logic on that. Um, there was something else I wanted to talk about. Uh, Surprised okay. you haven't talked about the Buffalo Bills. Are you trying? To well, <laughs> we made it to the eight. You know, I, last year when they got beat in the first round against the Texans, I said, you know what? They're going to be good next year. I, I got a feeling. And I was right. And they totally exceeded my expectations. I had no idea they were going to be this good to make it to the AFC championship game. Like, holy shit. And next year, I'm thinking, we, we take it all. We take the Lombardi trophy. Josh Allen is only in, he's only in his third year. Next year will be his fourth year. We got to get some players around him. We need a better defense. We need a, a middle linebacker, maybe another receiver to complement Diggs. Diggs isn't enough to get it done. We need two. like Jim Kelly had James Lofton and Andre Reed. You know what I'm talking about? So yeah, I'm thinking next year, if they make proper draft picks and put the pieces in place. Oh yeah. We're going to go after the Lombardi trophy next year. Somebody, I was reading on sports radio. Somebody was like the Buffalo should trade Josh Allen for. Uh, oh, that's crazy. That's crazy <laughs> talk. <laughs> Deshaun Watson. No way. I'm sticking with Josh Allen. He's come a long that's, way. Yeah. That's kind of, I just, I just kind of laughed. I kind of laughed too. They hired like a yeah, I saw that. Year old black coach to try to get him to stay. And they're like, He's like, I don't want to play for him. Oh, no, no, no. That boy, that, he's staying in Buffalo for sure. Yeah. I can't wait for next year. Uh, we're going all the way, baby. God damn it. We're finally going <laughs> to. You're, you're not as old as I am. I remember being, I must have been back in 1990. I must have been, I was, I was 19 years old. I wasn't even old enough to drink yet. And those, the Bills lost those four Super Bowls in a row. And like, that was heartbreaking. And it's been a long time since we even made the playoffs. And this year, to make it to the AFC Championship game, I have no regrets. We did great. I'm so proud of our boys. But with that comes expectations. And, yeah, next year, if I mean, if we, if we don't even make it to the AFC Championship game, that's a huge step down. That's going to be disappointing. No, we've got to go to the Super Bowl next year. So, And with that, let's end the show by saying – 
Thank you for listening. Please share with your friends. If you're in pharmacy and you're a tech, share the show with your fellow techs and turn them on to it. And just remember, every prescription you fill is another one closer to retirement, and we are out of here. Hello, it's your drug dealer. I thought I'd call in case you needed anything at all. You know, you can always call me just to talk. But I mostly want to sell you drugs. Drug dealer.